Well, good morning, Meadowbrook Church. It's good to see you. Good to be with you. Special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We are so glad that you're with us this morning. So it was the first day of my junior year in college, and I was walking onto campus for the first time that year. Now, between the summer of my sophomore year and my junior year, I ended up transferring schools. So in some ways, I was a new student at this school, but even though it was my first day on campus as a student, I wasn't really new. See, see my dad is a pastor. Uh, he's actually on staff at Elmbrook Church. But growing up, my dad was not a pastor. He worked in the hospitality industry, specifically in food service, and he did food service on college campuses. So I grew up with my dad being like the food service director for a specific campus, and he took care of all the food that happened anywhere on campus. So basically, I was raised on a college campus. Because my dad was a food service director, he would often work meal times, and so that meant if we wanted to have dinner as a family, we would go to the dining hall and have dinner with my dad at the dining hall. I also think that my mom was probably tired at some point of that battle of like, what's for dinner tonight, mom? And then she would tell us, and then we'd like have a meltdown and a revolt. I don't want to eat that, right? Any parents ever experience that? And so we would often go to have the dinner with my dad on campus at the dining hall. And as an elementary school kid, it was amazing. I mean, amazing. Every day we'd go, it was like there was pizza for dinner. You could get a burger. Like soda was just endless. I mean, it just freely flowed. And then for dessert, there was like the wall of cereal. You could have any pick. Lucky Charms, Captain Crunch. And so we would like eat like kings when we were in elementary school. And then after we finished dinner, we would, like, the campus was our playground. My mom would sit and chat with my dad for a little bit, and we'd run around the campus. We'd go to the game room in the arcade and just make ourselves at home. So I was very familiar with being on a college campus. And even when I was in middle school, the campus where my dad worked was really close to the middle school. So sometimes I would walk from the middle school to the campus, and I'd just go sit in the dining hall. I'd get something to eat, and people would walk up to me, and they'd be like, are, are you a student here? <laughs> Do you, do you go to school here? And I'm like, no, 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 my dad works here. And so it's my junior year of college, the first day I'm walking onto campus. And even though I'm a new student, I'm not new to this campus because this is the campus where my dad worked. This is the campus where I was raised, but I had this weird sensation and this weird feeling because I knew this campus like the back of my hand. Like, I knew all the back doors to certain buildings. I had been all over every square inch of the campus. I even knew faculty and staff. But I had this weird feeling of being completely alone. Because it's halfway through my college experience, and as I walked on campus, I was aware, I know no one here. I saw all the groups of different people gathering, walking from their dorms to the first period, reconnecting, talking about all the different things they did that summer. And I'm like, I know no one. Anybody else have ever had an experience like that before? Yeah. You can be in a very familiar place and feel all alone. You can be in the midst of a massive crowd of people and yet feel like you're there completely by yourself. So May oftentimes is graduation month, right? It's a month where people are graduating and moving on. And one of the things that gets passed around during graduation month is Dr. Seuss's Oh, the Places You Will Go. I love this book, right? It's one of those books that communicates, hey, as you step into this new chapter of your life, the possibilities for you are endless. You can go anywhere and be anything you want and do whatever you want to do. And there's this one point in the book where he says, oh, the places you'll go. There is fun to be done. There are points to be scored. There are games to be won. And the magical things you can do with that ball will make you the winningest winner of all. Fame. You'll be famous as famous can be with the whole wide world watching you win on TV. This great message of success. You can do it. Go be a somebody. And then you turn the page and he says, well, except when they don't. Because sometimes they won't. I'm afraid that sometimes you'll play lonely games too. Games that you can't win because you'll play against you. Alone. All alone. Whether you like it or not. Alone will be something you'll be quite a lot. 
And when you're alone, there's a very good chance you'll meet things that scare you right out of your pants. And there are some down the road between hither and yon that will scare you so much you won't want to go on. And so sometimes we can feel like that. Sometimes we can feel like we're all alone, we're in a sea of people, we're in a very familiar place, but yet I'm isolated and disconnected. It's been said that your understanding of who you are, your identity, isn't so much rooted in what you do accomplish or achieve, although we like to think that about who we are. Really, your identity is rooted in where you belong, to whom you belong. And we were created for relationship. We were created for connection. We were created to be with people. And one of the most disorienting experiences in our life can be when we're all alone. And so the question is, in those moments when we feel that way, what is the antidote? What is the remedy? Is there something we can call on to remind us of who we are and where we belong even when we're alone? I think our passage today, Romans 8, chapter uh, chapter 8, verses 14 through 17, answers that for us. And here's how this passage begins. Paul writes, For those who are led by the Spirit. Now, Paul has been in a section where he is contrasting two different ways to live. There are two different ways to walk through life. And he contrasts these by saying, one, he characterizes by the flesh. That's one way. And he says, living a life in the flesh is a life that is governed by sin. And the fruit of the flesh is evident in our life when we're succumbing to the flesh. And the fruit of the flesh is anger, rage, uh, discouragement, jealousy, envy, And oftentimes we find ourselves being hostile and resistant to God when we're operating in the flesh. You can see a list in Galatians 5 verses 19 through 21 of the fruit of the flesh. And he says the ultimate result of that sort of life is death, both a physical death and a spiritual death. And he says that the opposite of living a life in the flesh would be living a life in the spirit. And a life in the spirit is characterized by submission and surrender to God. And the thing that we experience when we walk in the spirit is the fruit of the spirit. And you find another list in Galatians 5 that lists all those things, but specifically in Romans 8, Paul has said that when we walk in the spirit, what we experience is peace, right? Love, joy, peace is available to us. And the end result of walking in the spirit is life, namely spiritual, eternal everlasting life. Now, up to this point in chapter 8, Paul has been using the language of location when it comes to God to describe our spiritual reality, meaning he's talking about, if he's, you know, making this distinction between the flesh and the spirit, he's talking about us in terms of us being in the spirit, our location is in the spirit, and the spirit being in in us. He's using this language of location, but here he talks differently. He shifts from location language to action language, and specifically the action he's referring to is that of following, this call to follow the Spirit. Now, oftentimes when something or someone leads us, we expect that we can both see and hear them. Like, for example, let's say after church today, I say, hey, I found this new place for lunch. You want to go with me? Yeah, let's go to lunch. And you say, where is it? And I say, well, just follow me. We hop into our car and we go. You're expecting to keep eyes on me the whole time so that you can know how to get there. Now, if you're really smart and savvy, you'll plug the location into your GPS. So that way, in case we get separated, you still will be able to see where you are. You'll have that blue dot that represents you following the blue line that gives you directions to where we're going. And you even hear your phone speak to you 200 feet till your next turn and 150 feet, turn left. 50 feet, your turn is right upon you, right? You have these audible cues and this visual for where and how to follow. Now, when talking about the spirit though, it's a bit different. 
Because the Spirit isn't necessarily visible, nor is there an audible voice. And so the question is, how do you discern the Spirit's leading in your life? Have you ever heard anybody say, oh, the Holy Spirit told me, and then fill in the blank, right? Some of us have maybe even said that. And that's not necessarily wrong, because the assumption of the New Testament is that the Spirit is continually active in our life. The Spirit is present with us continually because the Spirit resides in us. And so the Spirit is continually leading, guiding, and revealing and illuminating life to us. So it's not necessarily incorrect to say that the Spirit told me anything. But again, the question is, how do you know? How do you know if something is the Spirit. Now, people oftentimes wrestle with this question when it comes to discerning big life moments or big life changes. Maybe a job is offered in front of you, a move is presented to you, or maybe you just feel this prompting internally. You just have this thought of like, God might be doing something in my life, or you maybe even feel some measure of discontent or disruption And you start to ask yourself, like, is God in the midst of this? You could boil down discipleship down to two things, two questions. If you ask these two questions regularly, you could say, that is discipleship. Those two questions are, one, what is is God doing in my life? How is God at work in my life? What is he doing? Where is he leading me? How is he speaking to me? What is God doing? Question number two, how am I supposed to respond How am I being led to respond to what God is doing me, specifically where he's leading me? And I would say there's three simple things that you can do to discern whether or not something in your life is the Holy Spirit leading you in a certain direction. And the first thing you could do is you can test it against the scriptures. Specifically, God will never lead us into something That is against the scriptures. God will never lead us into a place of sin, nor will God lead us into a moment where we harm other people. And the scriptures reflect that for us. So if somebody has harmed you, and you want to get back at them, and you feel this prompting, maybe that's God calling me to get back at them. Well, you probably know that's not true. Because Right? It says in the scriptures to love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. So we test what we're experiencing against the scriptures. The other thing that you do is you test what you're experiencing with other people. You test it with other people who are also filled with the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, seeking to follow Jesus. So it was the spring of 2015, and our family had just moved. We were living in Atlanta at the time. We had just moved. It was the month of April. We were in a new house, and we had boxes all over the place. Um, My wife's mother was about to pass, and so she was visiting her in Minnesota. I was home with the three kids. We had boxes everywhere, very unsettled in our place, and an email came through my email asking if I would be interested and applying for a position at a church in Arizona. And I thought to myself, this is horrible timing. I mean, we've just moved. Like, my wife's mom is about to pass, and she's gone. And this is the worst time to be thinking about another move. But there was something about that email that I just couldn't shake. As though, like, there was something disruptive about it. There was a prompting. And so the first thing that I did was I called my dad, and I explained to him the situation. I said, Dad, from my vantage point, this is the worst timing ever. What should I do? And then I called the chairman of our elder board at that time at that church in Atlanta, and then I talked to one of the pastors that I was working with also at that time. And each one of them said, maybe you should explore it. My wife and I had been in a conversation for the last three years up to that point that was basically, is it time to move on? How do you know it's time to move on? Is God leading us to something else? And then this email comes through, and I just can't shake it. So she's gone in Minnesota visiting her mom when this email comes through. And I think to myself, I can't just tell her when she gets back, guess what? We're moving to Arizona, right? (laughs) But I said, in order for me to make a move on this, I'm going to get her insight on it. So I told her about it when she, got home, when she got home, and she was like, yeah, I guess. Why don't you take a look? And so the, the next thing that I did was I simply took the next step, tested it against the scriptures, tested it with, the, with other people, and took a next step. That next step was to submit my resume, apply for the job. I got an interview. It didn't go anywhere beyond that, 
But that interview led to a conversation with somebody else that led to another conversation with somebody else that ultimately sent me on a year journey of discerning a new call to ministry that ultimately led us here. And one of the things that's really frustrating about following the leading of the Spirit at times is that it's not always linear. It's not always instant. It doesn't come with complete clarity right away. What we love and what we wish would happen is that some message would be in the sky, right? That God would give us a, you know, kind of supernatural text message. But what God is after when it says those who are led by the Spirit, He's not after accuracy or perfection with your discernment. He's after relationship and the exercise of your faith. I have a friend that says misguided obedience is better than no obedience, meaning there are times that God might lead you to something or you think God is leading you to something, and if you test it against the scriptures and it's not sin, if you test it with other people and they say, yeah, you should check that out, you take a next step, you could be wrong. You could think God is leading you to something and you could be wrong. I could be way wrong about moving to Milwaukee. Maybe that was a huge mistake, right? Like, I didn't know, I, even as we made the move, I didn't have 100% certainty. I don't think it was a mistake. I'm really glad that we're here. But at the end of the day, what if it was? I mean, what if God was like, no, I wanted you to stay right there? One, God is gracious. He's compassionate and he's kind. And two, what he's after in our life is relationship and exercising our faith. He's not after accuracy or perfection in your following of him when it comes to discernment. He's after relationship and the development of your faith. And notice the metaphor that Paul uses to describe our following of him. He says, those who are led by the Spirit are what? Children of God. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of of God. Have you ever thought what it means? Have you ever thought about what it means to be a child of God? At some level, it means that God delights in you. Have you thought about that recently? That God delights in you. You, you bring this massive smile to his face. If you have ever watched a new mom holding their baby, baby there's nothing but delight and joy on their face. God delights in you. He loves you. You are His. Not only that, but there's dependency that comes, right? My, my kids need things from me. They know that I'm a source of life for them, that I feed them, that I clothe them, that I do things for them. They come to me constantly and ask for things because they know that they need me. There's delight and there's dependency. And sometimes, there's discipline. And we can think of discipline as like punishment, but I would say discipline in a spiritual sense is also guidance. It's also direction. And God, as our good Father, desires to guide us and direct us in life, and He gives us the Spirit dwelling in us in order to guide us moment by moment, day by day. And the hope for anybody who has raised kids as you work through delight, dependence, and discipline, the hope is that you would raise your kids so that they would flourish and thrive in no matter whatever circumstances come their way. And Paul is saying that's true of us with God. He's seeking to lead us through life so that we can get to a place where we can flourish and thrive as His Spirit leads us moment by moment, day by day. Now, as Paul talks about what it means to be a child of God, he contrasts and describes what a child of God is by saying specifically what it is not. He says this in verse 15. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. So Paul is contrasting this idea of slaves versus sonship. Now, most scholars will say, that one of the Old Testament stories that is a backdrop to this section in Romans, specifically Romans 5 through Romans 8, is the story of the Exodus in the Old Testament. Because in the book of Exodus, where are the Israelites? They're in Egypt. What is their situation while they are in Egypt? They are slaves 
What they are doing is they're building Pharaoh's empire brick by brick by brick. And as Exodus opens up, we find that the people of God are disempowered. Right at times as they're building bricks, Pharaoh makes it increasingly hard for them. He, he takes away the things they need to build bricks, and then he says, make more bricks. Your quota is higher today than it was yesterday, and he doesn't give them the resources. They're controlled, and they live in a constant state of fear. And so the story of the book of Exodus is God leading his people out of slavery to freedom. And he doesn't lead them out into the desert and be like, hey, good luck. I made you this far. I brought you this far. The rest is on you. And we read in Exodus 19 that he says, no, you are my treasured possession. I've brought you out here to re-narrate your identity, who you are, and specifically where you belong, and you belong to me. And so this idea of sonship as it compares to a slave is that children of God receive empowerment. God is seeking to empower us both with his spirit and with the scriptures so that we can be people who are set free. Set free not to live however we want, but to surrender to the design for which God has given us in life and then ultimately to rest in his love As it says in the scriptures, that perfect love drives out fear. We don't have to live in fear of God. We rest in his love. Why? Because we are his children. And what Paul says in the next few verses is specifically what we receive when we embrace the identity of being a child of God. And the first thing that we receive is authority. There is authority that comes with representing God in our world, and there's privilege that comes along with that authority, meaning in a household, a son or a daughter is going to have the authority of the parents. They're going to enjoy certain privileges of being a part of that household that the slave or the servants will not. So, for example, when I was growing up on a college campus, whenever I would go visit my dad, he would often send me on a run across campus to get coffee for him. There was coffee in the dining hall, but he thought it was much inferior to the coffee that was in the food court. That was a much higher, better, superior cup of coffee. And so I remember the first time he sent me over there, he's like, hey, can you go to the food court and get me a cup of coffee? And I was like, well, I need some money. I got to pay for it. He's like, oh, when you get there, just tell them that you're Mark Marvel's son and they'll take care of it. I was like, really? And so I go there. I get a cup of coffee, and this guy's behind the counter, and I'm like, hey. And he rings it up. He's like, oh, it's going to be, you know, $1.85 or whatever. I'm like, I'm Mark Marvel's son. He's like, oh, in that case, go ahead. Don't worry about it. He's like, it worked. It actually worked. (laughs) Like, I circled back around, and I got a soda. I got something else to eat. I was like, thanks, Jeff. I'm out, right? Like, there was authority and privilege that came with being a part of that family because of what my dad did on that campus. And we too have that authority, we have that privilege because we have status as sons of kings, the king of kings. Now what you see in the New Testament is there another story. There's the story of the prodigal son that also illustrates this. A son who has left home, he has taken his inheritance early, he has squandered it in a wild lifestyle, he hits rock bottom and he wants to return. But his mindset in return is that I'm going to return not as a son, but as a slave, right? He, he crafts this speech in his head, and he recites it the whole way home. And basically, part of his speech is just make me like one of your hired hands. Just make me like a servant. Make me like a slave. But when he comes home, the father says, no, 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 no. You are my son. He says, put a ring on his finger, put the best robe on him, sandals on his feet, kill the fattened calf because we're going to have a party and celebrate because my son was dead, but now he's alive. He is lost, and he is now found. So the son knows that he doesn't deserve those things, but sonship with God isn't earned. It isn't achieved. It's received, because you belong to him. And sonship is something that never changes. Being a a daughter or a son of the king Being a daughter or a son of anybody never changes. You are always the son of your parents. You're always the daughter of your parents. And so here we have a place of status and authority and privilege that comes from being a son of the king of the entire universe. The other thing that we receive, not only is it authority, but we also receive intimacy. This is what Paul says again in verse 15. You received, the spirit you received does not make you a slave, 
so that you do not live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him, we cry, Abba, Father. So not only do we receive authority, but we also receive intimacy. And the way that the scriptures describe God oftentimes is Lord. He is Lord and he is king. And all throughout the Old Testament, what you see is that there is this distance between God and his people. And the tabernacle resolutely, um, clearly, like, um, demonstrates that. Because God's presence is thought to, thought to live in the tabernacle, which is thought to be like his throne room as king, but not everybody can enter into the tabernacle. Only the high priest can enter in, and to the most holy of place where God's presence dwells, the high priest can only enter in once a year, and so there's this distance. In some ways, there's this separation. Even though God is dwelling amongst his people, he is distant from them. But when Jesus comes on the scene in the New Testament, he brings God's presence that much closer. He brings God's presence that much nearer. And now that the Spirit is dwelling in us, it's even closer still. And Paul is saying here, we don't address God as Lord, although we do. We don't address him as your majesty because he is king. We address him as father, but even still, sometimes the title father can seem formal, right? I've never called my dad father once. I mean, some people might, but I'm like, hey, old man, right? Or hey, God, you know, but he's saying here, we we call him Abba, which is an Aramaic word that literally translates to dad. God is our father, and there's this intimacy with him. There's this care that he provides because he says, we cry out to him, Abba, Father. Like the image here is one of needing help, of one of somebody in need saying, I need my dad. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. And what? I just need my dad to help me. Anybody here this morning in need of help? Yeah, anybody here in need of guidance through life? Paul's trying to say that you are a child of God. You have the Spirit dwelling in you, the Spirit of your Father, your Heavenly Father who wants to guide you moment by moment, day by day, to bring you to a life of flourishing, thriving, and wholeness. Not only do we receive authority and intimacy, but we also receive assurance. He says in verse 16 that the Spirit himself testifies, speaks to our spirit, that we are children of God. See, one of the things with spiritual adoption is living in this belief that I'm not really a son or a daughter. It's living in this belief that God doesn't really love me as much as people might say. It's this temptation to believe that I'm either less than, second rate, or not a full, legitimate child. Right? You see in the Exodus story that we referenced earlier, once God brings his people out of Egypt And he says, you're my treasured possession. Their temptation is to want to go back repeatedly. Maybe we should just go back to Egypt. Because maybe God really doesn't love us like he says he does. He's really not going to provide for us like he says he's going to. And so maybe it would just be easier to go back. Same with the prodigal son. He thinks when he goes home, there's no way my father will fully accept me as a son. And I wouldn't wouldn't, um, doubt if there are people here this morning who are wrestling with that as well. Does God really love me like the scriptures say he does. In 2007, there was a movie that was put out called Martian Child, starring John Cusack. And the storyline of the movie is that there's a, a single guy, played by John Cusack, who is a writer, and he writes sci-fi novels. And he has a sister who's a social worker, and she knows that there is a young child in foster care who is looking to be adopted. And she says to her brother, hey, maybe you should consider adopting this kid. And he says, why would you have me, a single guy, adopt a young boy? And she said, well, one of the ways he copes with reality and being a foster kid is he tells himself and everybody else that he's a Martian from Mars. And what he is here doing is he's sent on a mission to study what it means to be a part of humanity and a family. And I thought, he thinks he's a Martian. You write about Martians. So maybe it would be a good fit. And so the movie is the story of him adopting this young boy and bringing him into his family. Now, 
One of the things this young boy does on his mission is he catalogs everything with this Polaroid camera. And one day he walks into his dad's study while his dad's writing, and he takes a picture of his adopted dad writing a novel, and it scares and startles his dad. He turns around, they knock something over and break something. And the son thinks at this moment that his dad is going to send him away. But the father comes up with a creative idea to show that he really loves him, and he his creative idea to assure him that he will never send him away. Go ahead and, and take a look at this clip. We gotta put this camera away for a little while, okay? But I haven't finished my mission. Well, you have for today. But I haven't finished my mission! Give me my camera back! I need it! Hey, you gotta calm down. I have to go to work, or you can go to your room. You're gonna send me away, aren't you? Dennis, why would I send you away? Because you're mad at me. Because I broke your stuff. Dennis, I don't care about any of that stuff. This is stuff. There's nothing you can do that would ever change the way I feel. Do you understand? I'm not going to ever send you away. Look, this is just stuff. Break it like you mean it. One more. Let it go, buddy. Here's two. Oh, just one. Over the head. Over the Big time. It's like the Greeks. That feels so good. Did you catch that? He said, oh, that felt so good, right? But what does the dad say? He's like, there's nothing that you can do that will ever change the way I feel. There's nothing that you can do that will ever cause me to send you away. And the Spirit is testifying with our spirit, the Spirit of God testifying with our spirit that God loves you. He delights in you. You are His child, a full child. He will never send you away. And one of the things that we have to do, one of the tasks that we have as children of God is to learn how, discern, how to discern the voice of the Father and distinguish it from all the other voices in this world. Because there will be voices that enter our head that says, you're not good enough. He doesn't really love you. He doesn't really care for you. He died for everybody else except you, right? And we have to learn how to distinguish the voice of the Father from all the other voices in this world. And so not only do we receive authority, intimacy, and assurance, but we also receive an inheritance. This is how this passage ends, verse 17. It says, now if we are children of God, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we might also share in his glory. We are heirs of God with Christ, co-heirs, which means there is an inheritance coming our way. What it means to be a part of the family of God is that you will receive an inheritance that is due to all children in the family. Now, oftentimes we think that this inheritance is a mansion in the sky somewhere, right? We have this vision that one day we'll be swept up to heaven. There'll be streets of gold. I'll have my own private mansion filled with gold crowns and rubies and jewels. But the scriptures never paint a picture of us having an eternal mansion in the sky. Really, what the scriptures describe in terms of inheritance is new creation of this world, and you included, being restored to the way that God intended you. You you see this in 2 Corinthians 5. Paul writes, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, and the new is here. The vision of the New Testament, the way that the New Testament ends, again, isn't humanity getting swept off to another plane of existence But it's a new heavens and a new earth coming down from above that is going to remake and restore the world that we are in now in order that we can live into the full glorified state that God desired for us to be in at the beginning of time. And so we live with hope. That's what Paul will ultimately say in Romans chapter 8, is that we live with hope knowing that these broken bodies will one day be restored and everything will be made right and we will be caught up in this new creation moment and movement that God 
is going to do to restore everything, and it will last forever. And so you could essentially say this, what Paul is saying here is that in a world that's full of loneliness, when we find ourselves in a place of loneliness, God brings us into an eternal family. It's a family that's secure, that you have assurance that God is with you, that God is for you, that He's leading you, He's guiding you moment by moment, day by day. There's authority that you have to bear witness and represent the King of Kings in this world. You have this intimate connection with Him. He's continually reminding you and assuring you, I love you, I will never leave you nor forsake you, and the kingdom is yours. And so the question we started with is, what is the antidote to loneliness? In part, it's believing what the Scriptures say about us to be true, that you are children of God, that you are part of a new spiritual family. And that means for us, one of the things we do in response is we embrace being a part of this family. We get connected, we plug in, we, we engage with one another to say we're not just people going to the same church. We're brothers and sisters. That's the language you find in the New Testament. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. We are heirs of the King of kings and Lord of lords. So may you see that you are a son and daughter of the King. May you cry out to Him in your time of need, trusting and knowing that He will come to your help because He is a good and gracious Father and may you be assured that there is nothing that you can do that will ever separate him from you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the graciousness that you have bestowed on us through Jesus Christ. That we are your heirs. That we are your children. That you have given to us everything we need and more. And so, Lord, I pray that we would rest in the fact that you love us, that you delight in us, you desire to guide us through your Spirit and bring us into a life of flourishing and wholeness. And so, Lord, I pray that you would teach us how to do that and that we would be receptive and open to your leading. We're grateful, Lord, because we don't deserve all that you have done for us and have given to us. We pray this in your name. Amen.